When you're running and growing a small business, you need different frameworks. You need different infrastructure to put in place. And I'll never forget, I think we were out on the golf course and I, you know, trying to get stuff done while we were out there. And you were like, dude, what are you doing? You need to put some processes in place so that you don't have to be the one in the business for every single little aspect. Put the right pieces and the right infrastructure in place and the right people, giving them the opportunities for them to make the decisions in the right frame. Hi everyone and welcome to Design Development, your hub to learn direct from top performers in real estate development, design, and construction. I'm your host, Renz Hayes, founding partner of h and lifelong learner, and I am personally obsessed with high-powered organizations and the leaders that guide them. If this is your first time listening, thank you so much for tuning in, and if you're a returning listener, welcome back. Let's go. I'm excited to share today's episode with you. My guest, Benji Mall, he's the CEO and founder of Arcs Urban. I, I just love what they've done. They've kind of come into Boston real estate and really carved out their unique corner of the of the market. We talk about creative capital stacks and debt financing and the relationships that it takes to really find a way to create affordable housing to, to help people and invest in long-term real estate assets. I really enjoy the conversation. I hope you do too. And without further ado, let's get to my conversation with Benji Mall. Benji, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Great to be here. All right. So for, for the listeners that are unfamiliar with you or Arcs Urban, could you give them some context and tell us a little bit about yourself and what Arcs Urban is all about? Sure. Um, my name is Benji Mall. I am the, uh, the founder and one of the principals of Arcs Urban. Uh, we're an eight-year-old uh, real estate investment and development shop based in the greater Boston area, focused primarily on housing. And you know, our, our, our general thesis is try to be different from everyone else in trying to innovate around the capital stack and design, um, both on the uh, retrofit of existing buildings as well as, as new construction. And so ultimately, um, our goal is to solve the housing crisis, right? And we can't do it alone, but our goal is to really be the standard bearer for new types of housing projects and really how they're put together from a financing and uh, design and development perspective. Very cool. And, and when you say a new type of housing product or like creative capital stacks, I know you have a focus on affordable housing or like socially minded development, but how is it uh, different than a traditional when you think about traditional, you know, merchant builders, you know, the folks that are building the most number of units, at least in Massachusetts, right? It is, I don't want to say a fully commoditized product, but if you're building class A housing, you're going to have 8% of the building is going to be amenity space. And you're going to have the very similar unit mix between studios and one beds and two beds. And you're going to have generally very similar kind of product. The design might be a little bit different you know, what, what the exterior of the building and the architecture might be a little di bit different, but it's going to kind of look and feel the same. And so it's really, really hard to innovate from, you know, a, a type of housing typology, right? And so um, we have really spent a lot of time thinking about capital structure as a way, and by capital structure, I mean how these projects get financed as a way to, um, to change really how we think about building construction, um, and acquiring new housing. Um, and so when we started our company, um, oh wow, eight years ago, we kind of came from the real estate private equity world. We really, um, we really were kind of, uh, were taught how to acquire buildings based off of just purely return metrics. And we acquired a bunch of buildings and the whole idea was doing value add multifamily real estate where we would buy buildings and then upgrade units, push rents, and then get financial returns, right? You basically sell the building or refinance the building and you get a certain return on your investment and IRR and equity multiple and cash returns. And ultimately what we kind of came to realize is, especially in the class B space, in the workforce housing space, the idea of value add investing is not really, um, doesn't really mesh well with the political environment that we're in right now and doesn't really mesh well with kind of how we wanted to grow our business um, and, and how we wanted to you know, ultimately make a living. I didn't want to make a living by going into a building, kicking people out um, and, and causing some housing instability. So what we kind of focused on was raising capital to buy and build buildings for the long term, right? With 
the goal of, hey, let's buy the building, we'll own it for a really long period of time, we'll stabilize the in-place tenancy, meaning that if they're tenants of good standing in buildings, we basically are going to provide self-imposed rent caps on them so that they have housing stability because housing stability has been shown to be one of the most important um, indicators of success for children and families um, from an environmental perspective. And when we did that, um, we basically, we did it in a few buildings. Um, we bought some buildings that were on the city of Boston bad property task force list. We worked with the community organizations, um, the tenant associations and the, and the city to turn some of these buildings around, which had a ton of deferred maintenance, but doing so without displacing a lot of these tenants who had lived there for 10, 15 years and had always been the folks who were looking out for their community, who are the one policing their community and providing maintenance and capital work on the building, even though that they weren't the owners. And so what we found was um, there is this incredible bucket of capital out there that is looking for long-term ownership, housing stability, um, and that really meshes well with kind of what our belief is with how these buildings should be operated. Um, and so we got a, a lot of acclaim from the city of Boston. And so we originally were utilizing kind of social impact equity that we, we raised um, to do these projects. And then um, municipalities started taking notice and said, hey, look, we want to fund some dollars to do this on a more programmatic basis and to do it not just based on your business plan, but do it through income restrictions at the property level. Very cool. I, I, I can see how that's a development's not an easy game and buying real estate in Boston is no easy feat, right? It is expensive property. So it, what an honorable mission to try to buy long-term assets so that you can maintain rent caps for it to be affordable long-term, but you got to be real creative in how you go about doing that. Something I noticed with you and Danny early on, I think we've known each other for probably six years now or so is that you we're building all the right relationships with the people in the city and the community that we're really supporting and finding out a way to advance affordable housing. And I always thought that that was really cool. Um, I mean, one of the things I'd is like, like to... I didn't, I didn't come from the affordable housing world. Right. So, you know, from these kind of early deals where we memorialize these self-imposed rent restrictions, um, we were able to basically get new sources of capital for new development. But I didn't really speak the language because I didn't come from the traditional affordable housing background, right? I came from yes. the real estate private equity world. And when you're looking at a, a, a multifamily development that's income restricted, affordable, kind of capital A affordable, and then you look at a, a multifamily development that is you know, a, a traditional market rate development, there's very little that's the same outside of some of the construction aspects. But from a capital structure standpoint, it's complaining playing two completely different games. And our goal was really to bridge the gap because there are learnings from both sides, right? And there are ways that you can take the private markets and you can take some public subsidy and municipal, you know, municipal finance and combine the two to create new types of um, ways to build housing from a financial standpoint. So cool. And this really reminds me, there's kind of a movement when I think of private equity, thinking of private equity that are buying private businesses, there's sure. a whole movement that's really gained momentum called conscious capitalism. It sounds a lot about what you're trying to do in real estate. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it is still capitalism, right? And, and we do want to grow a business and we want to grow a sustainable organization and we want um, our employees and um, our investors to do well. And we think it's really important to do well by doing good. So, um Love it's that. something that we're very proud of, but at the same time, each of these projects have to make financial sense for us. You know, early on, we were able to do these projects for much smaller margins when we just didn't know any better when we were trying to grow. Now we're very, very selective about continuing to do projects and only do projects large enough to really support the continued growth of our organization. Something you said there, and I might not say exactly the same, but you want to do well, but you want to do well by doing good. In my mind, that's an abundance mindset, right? Like you already said, you don't want to come in and buy real estate, buy real estate and an existing asset and then kick people out 
make it nice and jack rents up to make the financial pro forma look really nice. You want to do well and it's got to make financial sense, but you want to do well while doing good by others, right? And the abundance mindset is like being successful by, by helping others be successful. And I, I love that approach to honestly life. Like when someone's success is in spite of others or at the detriment of others, I think that's a tough life to live. But if you can help everybody around you be successful, then life's a lot more enjoyable that way. Yeah. I mean, you know how, how challenging and, and, and messy this industry can be sometimes. And I think if, if, if folks pretend otherwise, then, you know, they're not really, they're not really paying attention. Um, but you know, I think if, if, if you just treat people like you would like to be treated, and I think that goes for, for, especially in real estate, when you're buying existing buildings, I think that's super important. Um, so we've been very fortunate, right? We've, we've, we landed in the right spot in terms of in Boston, working with a, a great city government that's willing to uh, be thoughtful and innovative um, and really help us kind of pilot some of these new programs as well as the, the state, um, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts has, has also um, been fantastic about uh, utilizing resources, not just for us, but for other developers to, to try to figure this out, right? And, and I think that's what sets uh, Massachusetts apart from many other states um, in, in the country. So important to, to build those relationships. But again, you guys are leading with the right intent. So it's easy to get behind you. And I'm sure the people in the state, in the city, like really enjoy working with people like you. Um, Hope so. I'd like to pivot a little bit, go back to some of the early times. So sure. you went to Tufts, undergrad and graduate, right? You got an MBA. Uh, yeah, I got an MBA from, from Dartmouth. There was something that really stuck out to me that I wanted to hear a little bit more. You were a two-time tripod champion. Oh, that was in business school. I appreciate you uh, you bringing that up. I started playing hockey as, um, I think, as a 26-year-old. I'd skated a few times in my life, but wasn't very good. Uh, tripod basically is a... Uh, is a hockey league for those who had never put. Yeah, exactly. You need the skate to stand up. It's your, it's a third leg of the tripod. And I, I, uh, had an absolute blast learning to play. I can't wait to teach my kids how to play. I'm very, very bad still, but I, uh, I have a lot of heart and I think that, uh, I love, I, I just loved it. There's nothing better than being out on the ice and also playing pond hockey too, you know, being That's up awesome. in New Hampshire and Vermont and just playing pond hockey for hours and hours on end. It's just uh, amazing memories. That's awesome. And so your undergrad and grad degree, were they real estate and finance focused? No. So uh, undergrad, I was a psychology major, um, like organizational psychology, which I'm sure is right up your alley, Renz. Um, and I, I love that. Like I honestly, when I was in school, I completely dismissed the importance of psychology and where I am today, it's like the most important thing to understand. It applies to every aspect in life, like psychology. Yeah, so. and and I was kind of choosing whether whether to be a teacher or whether to go to Wall Street. And and there wasn't, you know, in my senior year of college, and so I tried teaching. Uh, I was a sixth grade earth science teacher. Um, as kind of an aide and, and part-time teacher in the Somerville schools in Winter Hill. Um, and it was um, very challenging. And so I kind of said, oh, my God, this is, this is crazy. Teaching is very, very hard. And, and I decided to, uh, to, to go to Wall Street instead and started my career at Lehman Brothers on the mm -hmm. trading floor, which was, uh, I mean, couldn't have gone two more opposite paths, but I had a lot of interests. And, uh, you know, starting my career right in the middle of the Great Recession. Those Didn't are last very long in Lehman them. Brothers, let's just say that. Yeah. What, what kind of takeaways do you have from that experience, I guess, at Lehman Brothers or in the private well, equity? Well, I would say know what you don't know. Um, and I think coming out of, out of Tufts, I was, you know, really uh, bright-eyed and, and didn't know what I didn't know. And I went into – I was working on the trading floor at Lehman Brothers – right in 2008, right, as the company was uh, was going under. And I remember the CEO at the time, Dick Fold, came onto the trading floor and, uh, you know, he, he said to everybody, you know, we should, everyone should be buying Lehman Brothers stock. We should be pushing everyone to, 
to support our company and we're going to beat down all those naysayers and everyone should be buying the stock. And so I, you know, I called everyone, my parents, I said, we should be buying Lehman Brothers stock. And, you know, hoorah. Th- th- thank- th- hoorah. And thankfully they said, mm, why don't you, you know, you've been there a week. Why don't we learn a little bit more? And, and we obviously know what happens with, with the company. And um, fortunately the group that I was working for ended up um, being acquired by Barclays. And that's where I, I did, a brief investment banking stint at Barclays and then went to JP Morgan to their uh, real estate private equity group, which is really where I cut my teeth and learned the kind of institutional real estate um, investment world. Um, but I always knew that I wanted to do something a little bit more entrepreneurial. Um, and this was all in New York and I, and I wanted to be, uh, I wanted to move back to Boston. So um, went to Tuck and it was there that, you know, found, found a few rabbis who, a few a, f- a few mentors who really helped me think through how to launch Arx Urban, and it was you know Arx Urban was the tenth name of the company, and we had all these business plans. And originally, I was going to start by building eight townhomes in Vermont as part of a class project, and I, I was actually going to build it as well. Um, and went and had a whole bunch of conversations with in, much smarter investors than me, and they basically said, Benji you are going to spend so much time and energy for so little return just to build these eight townhomes. I know it's convenient because you're there, but we love your hustle. We love your institutional background. Why don't you come work for us and we'll back your firm um, in the greater Boston area. And uh, when you graduate and that's, that's essentially how we got our start is that through this class project met a whole bunch of investors um, and one firm in particular in New York that, uh, I'm friends with the, the founders of, of the firm today, and they really help us launch our wow. company. So we did our first few projects with them. Um, and then so let me recap that. So you, you spent a few years working um, on, on Wall Street in investment banking, kind of private equity. Then you yep. realized I'm going to go. You went back to your MBA, and that's when you went to Tuck at Dartmouth. Yep. And in that time, you're, you recognized the entrepreneurial wall. Uh, drive you had and you wanted to launch a business. So you were working on that plan with your community at Tuck? Yeah. So, I mean, Tuck is a very small business school with, you know, I think it's like 250 uh, kids per class. And so I immediately was branded as like the real estate guy. There weren't a lot of people who had real estate private equity experience. So anytime there were questions about real estate or people were thinking, you know, thinking generally about projects that involved real estate, Somehow it always got back to me. I was the president of the real estate club and it was such a small community that when this parcel of land came up, all these people are like, oh, Benji, you're the real estate guy. Why don't you develop it? We need more housing. And that's kind of one thing led to another. Um, And I was really going down two paths when I was in business school. I was deciding, do I want to work for a property tech, a prop tech company, right? And, And at the time, this was in 2012 and 13, the Jobs Act had just been what passed. is prop tech? Prop tech, uh, property technology. So uh, companies that are typically venture backed or um, are, are high growth technology companies that are um, in the real estate space. Okay, and so the companies that I were talking to in 2012, 2013, there was. Um, a this wild growth of real estate crowdfunding because of the passing of the jobs act which allowed general solicitation of capital meaning if i had a real estate deal i can go put it online and i can advertise uh advertise a deal to raise equity from a whole bunch of folks and that 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 new law allowed this to happen and so all of these companies were built around this this process and so in business school, I was kind of making the choice between being a real estate entrepreneur on the investment and development side. Do I want to go sponsor my own projects or do I want to go work for one of these real estate crowdfunding companies and be the second or third or fourth employee or start my own? Right. And by the time I graduated business school, I think there were 72 different crowdfunding companies across the country. And I basically made the assessment that you know, from a risk adjusted standpoint, it was a much better return for me to be my own real estate sponsor and investor. And then I can use utilize this way of innovative 
way of raising capital because I had so much exposure to the industry. So um, as opposed to me going to one of these startup companies and for it to have been paid off for me to do that, I would have had to, the company would have had to be incredibly successful. I would have had to be the first five employees. And I thought the chances of me choosing the right real estate crowdfunding company to work for were probably pretty low. Um, so I feel very fortunate that I made that decision because of the 82, I think there's three or four that are still kind of in business and their business plans have morphed tremendously. Wow. Yeah. I mean, what perspective, right? The, the, it's easy to say to be the number four or five rather than to put everything on your back and go start a new business, but venture back prop tech only four around today. So I'd say you made a good decision because what's the chances that you chose four out of the one of the four? Uh, you know, that, that, that was, that was the thinking. And, you know, we became the first sponsor to raise capital through crowdfunding, um, so in cool. new Eng in new England. And so that kind of became part of our brand with crowdfunding in new England. Yeah. So we did a deal wow. in 2014 where we did a, uh, where, where we worked with one of the crowdfunding sites. I think we ended up raising three or 400,000 bucks. And I think it was more, it was probably more pain than it was worth to do it. We probably could have raised the capital much easier just through through uh, our investor network. Um, but it was really important to me to prove and to show that we are kind of on the front line of innovation when it comes to putting these deals together. That's uh, smart. Yeah, you're not only so. just trying to make the deal successful, but you're trying to build momentum for the company to be successful, right? Exactly. It's a really so. good way to look at it. The, the investment banking experience, did that, did, when I hear the word investment banking, and I know it more from the private side, not necessarily public, it's essentially, they're more or less like the realtors of private business mergers and acquisitions, right? Is that the exposure you got? Yeah. So I was, I, I had, I guess, kind of two gigs. One right. was where I was basically working, um, covering real estate investment trusts thinking through IPOs, refinancings, valuation, stuff like that. Um, and what I learned there, I mean, it was a great learning experience because I was in the back of a cube, not talking to anybody all day and, um, you know, working in spreadsheets. And I just, it wasn't very fulfilling to me. And then I went to work in, at, um, at the real estate and uh, private equity fund. And it was much more asset specific where I was overseeing property management teams, financing teams, um, valuation teams. And I was really more of a general manager as opposed to in more of an analytical role. Um, and I think it's really important to have that base skill set and, and really understand the numbers. But yes. I think that role, the next role really solidified my desire to be a general manager, right? To be uh, an inch, uh, a mile wide and an inch deep as opposed mm -hmm. to, a, you know, a mile deep and an inch wide. And I think you really, th there's room for both, right? Depending on in an organization, being the leader of an organization, as long as you're really self aware and can find folks who can support and, and do the opposite of you. Right. Um, yes. I like to make a connection between you said how important it is to really know the numbers when you're getting into real estate development. And I think for most people, that's an easy concept to understand. Like, of course you need to know the numbers if you're going to buy a building and, and raise equity and get a bunch of debt, you got to be able to prove that the math works. That same thing is often overlooked in business. I would say most businesses or most business leaders, they don't really have a good handle on the financials. And it's something that's not really taught in general education is like business financials, but it gives you context and it becomes kind of your, they're your gauge system. If you know how to connect the numbers to everything that's going on in the business so that we can, we, or you can make better decisions. Right. I think, I think, I mean, look, Renz, you've been a, a, uh, hugely influential, whether you realize it or not. in in how I've thought about our company, just from our times together, me picking your brain about organization and structure. And, you know, I spent a lot of money, I got an MBA and it was a fantastic experience and I wouldn't give it up for the world. But at the same time, you know, some of the things that you're learning there are really to, to, to run a, you know, 30,000 person company, right. Or to, um, or, or really much more on the financial aspect of a, a much larger business when you're running and growing a small business, 
you need different frameworks, you need different infrastructure to put in place. And I'll never forget, I think, I think we were out on the golf course and I, you know, was trying to get stuff done while we were out there. And you were like, dude, what are you doing? Like, you need to put some processes in place so that you don't have to be the one in the business for every single little aspect. Um, and took me down this rabbit hole, right? Where over the years, I've certainly, you know, reached out to you and, and really thinking about systematizing our business, putting the right infrastructure in place. Um, and it's something now that, right, I'm trying to basically get myself out of every little decision that needs to be made and really put the put the right pieces and the right infrastructure in place so and, and the right people, which we certainly are have and are con- going to continue to grow, giving them the opportunities for them to make the decisions in the right framework. Wow. Thank you so much. And I, I think you guys are doing a tremendous job. It's been fun to watch Arcs Urban grow. You guys are doing great stuff and leading with the right intent. And I was actually, as we're, I'm getting to know more about your story today and your experience with the MBA, I actually look at like your degree, like you really got a lot of value out of going back to that MBA and like use that community to help launch your entrepreneurial career and get a business going. So a hundred percent. But I think what I, what in all the, I spent all my time right in the, in the networking and growing that community and growing the support network and getting the confidence to mm-hmm. go start the company. But then what I, what I didn't get really was the infrastructure and the framework about like, once you're doing it, Right. Once you have some growth and you have employees, like how do you manage people? How do you mm-hmm. ensure that stuff doesn't fall through the cracks? How do you ensure that you're not make have to make every single decision? Right. And yeah. I think that just comes with time and you really just have to be a, you know, I know you're a big proponent of lifelong learning and it's just like, you gotta, gotta. you know, figure out what the problem is and figure out how other people are solving it and implement some sort of solution and can keep iterating on it. Right. Cause it's not going to be perfect yeah. the first five times you do it. You got it. And, that is in my growth and I think just the growth of any small business leader when you're the expert and you're taking on the risk and it's your financial burden and you start to build a team, but you're not a complete organization yet, right? Like you lack training, you lack process, you lack communication tools. And so naturally like people that work for you, they are going to make mistakes and they're going to make mistakes that you know you wouldn't have made probably because you already made them before and already paid that toll that tax to learn that lesson. Um, but what is it really the 80% important. rule, right? If someone else can do something 80% as well as you, like you probably shouldn't be doing it. Correct. So, because if um, you can get two people, 80 and 80 is 160 versus 100 to you. And then the chances are, if they learn like your, your organizational value and your organizational opportunity continue to scale, right? Right. You got to right. let them grow. And I think that's the big pivot is you're not, you're not optimizing for today. You're trying to build a business that's going to be successful in five years. And what does that take? That takes people on your team growing and make, making mistakes and learning. So if you, I mean, I'm not even thinking five years. We're thinking about like multi, multi-decade kind of vision, right? I mean, we're thinking okay. like 30 years, right? How, where are we going to be in 30 years? And sometimes that's hard because you see a lot of companies that you know raise capital and, and they're pushed to grow much faster or you know they do things... Um, they do things purely for growth. And I think you have to kind of keep the blinders on, keep your head down and just keep doing things slowly, surely, methodically, and and the rest Mm -hmm. will take care of itself. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And so in private equity, actually in real estate, when I think of private equity in terms of buying businesses or that private, yeah, private equity buying private businesses, it's usually a, the traditional method is a 10 year hold period, right? So you deploy capital, takes a few years to deploy the capital, then it's making money back for about five years. And then you got to get the capital back out to pay the investor back in 10 years. It's usually a 10 year hold. Is it a similar cycle in real estate? I mean, there's a little bit of everything, right? So there's closed end funds, which operate in a very, very similar manner to what you're talking about. There's open ended funds, which are tend to be kind of more core oriented where you're buying the real estate and, um, investors essentially more like a mutual fund for kind of more stabilized real estate. But typically the real estate private equity, what they're doing is they're either allocating, they're allocating capital typically to other developers or to a a strategy that they can execute on their own. Um, and, and putting that money to work over a a time frame of of their fund and then going out and raising the next fund. Right. So the problem I think from our perspective, 
that doesn't mesh very well with investing in workforce housing, right? Where you have to continually sell the assets, right? In order to make a return for your investors, right? Where, uh, you know, in order to, 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 to make that return, you sell the asset, the next person comes in, they have to make a return. So they then go and, you know, push further, push rents further. And that it's a challenging cycle, not to mention the fact that there are several advantages to holding multifamily real estate for a long period of time. If it's okay with you, let's go through an example. Let's say that I'm looking to invest in workforce housing with Arcs Urban long-term capital. It seems like 10 years is too short of a cycle for this type of investment strategy. Um, so if I'm investing in a deal with you, how does that work over the long term? Is it 20 year or 30 year hold? Is there dividends at some point, a recap? How does yeah, that so there's, so, so I mean, I think the way that we think about it is this, is you invest in a project, we'll, we'll underwrite it typically on a 10 year hold period, right? So that you can compare it from on apples to apples basis with a real estate private equity fund. Um, what we'll do is we are incentivized in the way we structure our deals for the long term to hold these projects for the long term. We're incentivized because we have a promote structure on both uh, cash flow and on a capital debt, meaning if we refinance the asset, we're able to pay down equity, or if we distribute, uh, if we distribute cash flow, once we distribute a certain level of cash flow, the, our company, Arcs Urban, receives uh, a promote uh, a piece of the cash flow above and beyond a certain point. And so what that does is it incentivizes us not always, we're not always incentivized by total return, what private equity funds typically use as an IRR me metric, right? Where that's, there is, that is so time focused, right? Mm -hmm. The longer you hold an asset, the harder it is to get a high IRR because it's, it's a time-based metric, right? Yep. And so what we try to do is remove that time-based metric from how the, our compensation is calculated to incentivize us to hold the assets for a longer period of time. And ultimately, I mean, typically our typical project, we are making investor distributions four times a year on a quarterly basis. Um, and we anticipate that all capital will be returned through the first five to seven years. So uh, many of our investors view kind of owning these assets as mailbox money, right? They invest yeah. with us. And they'll just continue to get checks over the long term that hopefully will grow with inflation. Um, but we'll also, because of our unique strategy from an operational front, you know, maybe we might not grow those cash flows as quickly as another sponsor might. But at the same time, we have um, less variability in the cash flows. We're going to hold the assets um, for generally a long period of time um, and, and a lot of stability as well for the, the tenant base. Yeah, I love that. And, and there's something to be said for, for the long term hold. I, I think I've heard what's the difference between uh, a good deal and a bad deal. And the answer is 10 years, right? The, there's not really a bad real estate play if you look out on a 10 year horizon. So if you can make things work today, and it seems like based on that example, if I understood it correctly, if I'm putting capital in, chances are I'm going to get that capital back in a five to seven year period, but then I still have a percent of ownership of that asset in perpetuity is the idea. And yeah, that's, that's certainly the goal. And, and you know, right. I mean, it, it, you know, we think about our investors think about, they want a dollar cost average into this stuff, right? They want to invest a little bit every year and just keep it going. And they're not going to worry so much, just like investing in the stock market very, very tough to time. Anyone who says, oh, we're at the, you know, we're at the peak or we're at, we're at the bottom of the market. It's a great time to buy. You know, it, it's nonsense, right? No one knows what's going to happen in the future. So we put long-term financing in place. We are, have a lot of margin of safety, meaning we, we're at relatively low leverage to other sponsors that are playing kind of in our, in this arena. Um, and, and we invest for the long term and we're going to make decisions that are not necessarily going to be in order to juice the total return, but are going to be for the best thing for the asset for the next 20 years. That's really cool. I, I love that. And, uh, could you tell us some of the projects that you're most proud of? Yeah. So, so, I mean, what we're talking about right now are investment, um, acquisition and rehabilitation projects. So typically there won't be subsidy in those projects. That's kind of playing on the market rate side of the business. 
um, and we've done a few of those projects. I think one of the ones I'm most proud of, um, we bought a building in the city of Boston, 49 unit project that was on the city's bad property task force list. This is a, a building that uh, the owners lived overseas. Um, they didn't invest a lot of capital in the project. And ultimately it was kind of mayhem. There was no oversight of the building. There was no tenant screening. And um, in one weekend, I think the building got 65 calls to the, the, the police department. And we acquired the building. We worked with the Boston Police Department, the community organization, um, the, the neighborhood association that was basically the building was in. And then the tenants uh, formed a tenant association that we ended up partnering with to ensure that the folks who were living there for a really long period of time, um, that they weren't displaced when we started renovating the buildings. And so um, we did this project six or seven years ago. And over that period of time, we raised rents very slowly for existing tenants. When units came to market, we rolled those units to market and we renovated the building. We provided security, we provided tenant screening, and it's been very, very quiet ever since. Um, in fact, Danny won a, a, an award from the Boston Police Department, uh, a recognition for turning that building around. I think it was one of the most notorious buildings in the city. Um, and then just last year, um, we ended up partnering with the city of Boston to memorialize those income restrictions at the building so that uh, of those 49 units, um, they not only were they income restricted based on our self-imposed rent caps, but they then provided capital to income restrict them into perpetuity to basically prevent displacement um, forever in the building from um, from an affordable housing standpoint. So we're, we're, we're thrilled with the result of that. And I think that's a great way that kind of shows the conscious capitalism. Our investors made a great return on their capital and, and great cash flow, but then we were able to income restrict the building so that um, even more folks basically will have the opportunity to live there at, at a uh, affordable rent. Um, That's so. absolutely a project to be proud of. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that was kind of what that project really kind of gave us a lot of recognition um, within the city. And then from there, we started doing more ground up development because we had the resources um, both from a municipal and, um, and state level were, were, they were willing to provide us funding in order to kind of replicate this type of housing. And so we would then went and did uh, the meeting house project, which I think actually you guys worked on, yep. um, where we built a project that was a third affordable, a third middle income and a third market rate, uh, actually right across the street from that other project. So very cool. Um, yeah, really excited about that. And then um, you're also working on a project for us right now. We're building a uh, 282 unit co-living building um, right by the Harvard Enterprise campus in Alston. Yep. For those traveling down the Mass Pike, it's right on, uh, if you're coming into the city, it's right on your left as you, you come across the Cambridge and uh, Brighton exit. It's a pretty cool building, five on one post-tension podium. Uh, really exciting project. And those are the micro living, right? And you were kind of, you were early on the micro units in Boston. We were early, but it took a long time to permit. Um, and then COVID delayed us a little bit. But um, yeah, I mean, it's basically 280 suite style units. Um, the intent is that there will largely be graduate students, traveling nurses, young professionals in the community. And it's a way of using market, market, um, market rate housing to create you know, affordable housing opportunities, right? So mm -hmm. by renting some of these smaller units, um, we're going to, they'll be fully furnished. All utilities will be included. Um, and it's kind of what, what we think about is a, a lot of young professionals, they move to Boston, they go onto Craigslist, they find uh, a roommate and they move into kind of a fully furnished place and they, they, they pay a certain amount of money. They've got, um, and it's kind of very uninstitutionalized, right? You don't really know whether or not you're going to like your roommates. You got someone's got to figure out how to pay the cable. Someone's got to figure out how to pay the utility bills. And you know, one roommate moves out, and all of a sudden you're stuck figuring out how to fill that. I think what this type of housing is trying to do is solve for that and get some of our younger professionals out of the triple deckers, which were really originally built as family style housing. Um, and really get them to to move into this purpose-built housing for young professionals. 
Yeah, I think the micro unit makes a ton of sense for the professional. And just hearing that they're fully furnished, I mean, not having to carry a couch up a winding stair in a triple decker sounds pretty nice. <laughs> and like getting I, getting out of the September 1st moving day in, in all apartments across Boston is a great thing. Yeah, I think, I think that the whole idea is to just make living easier and more affordable. Um, and, and so we're really excited that project should, uh, should deliver, um, middle of next year. That's really exciting. I can't wait to see that one, uh, open up. It's going to be, yeah. Um, what's your, and I know no one has a crystal ball, but I got to ask you anyway, cause you seem to be on the inside. Uh, what's your market prediction? Like let's say in Boston, the multifamily market prediction over the next 36 months. Yeah, I mean, I think I think right out? now a lot of folks um, are finding it very challenging to build market rate multifamily housing and making the economics work. Right, yep. interest rates have risen to a, a, a incredibly quickly. I think the the, the, the fastest ever um, construction costs. Obviously, we've seen incredible amount of escalation since uh, since COVID, and so we've gotten to a point where anyone who's permitted or um, or acquired land to build multifamily housing, you know, it's very, very challenging to make the numbers work. Um, and so what we feel very fortunate in our platform is that we can kind of, we can play on the market rate side if, if that world works, or we can play on the affordable housing side if that world works. So what we're seeing is a lot of folks pivot to towards affordable housing if they have the resources and know how to, to do that, or they're just having to wait. And so, you know, the lack of, projects that are going to get started in the next 36 months, you know, probably 24 months. It depends on kind of what happens with rates and construction costs, I think is going to exacerbate our housing crisis even further. And so I think we'll see in, in 24 months, some pretty substantial rent growth because, you know, our population is, is not decreasing, but um, it's, it, our population is increasing, but our housing stock is basically going to be staying the same. And so, uh, will just ultimately lead to, to future rent growth. Um, and I think at some point, hopefully as rates come back down and maybe construction escalation moderates, there will be the opportunity to, um, to, build, to build new market rate multifamily products. On the affordable side, there is, while there's the most amount of resources ever, right, to build affordable housing in the state, there also is, uh, huge gaps in most projects because construction costs and rates have increased. So um, it's becoming even more and more challenging to build affordable housing as well. Um, but there will continue to be um, an immense amount of affordable housing that are built by nonprofit and for-profit developers. It just takes longer and longer to do so. Yeah, there's there's a lot of challenges in the market, the rising rates, as you mentioned, in the, the recent escalation costs and construction. And we haven't seen that normalize yet with the rates. Like, so interest rates go up, our buying power goes down, but the construction costs were built on the old rates at 3%, right? Same thing in single family homes. Like well, I'll ask you that power. question. I mean, are you starting to see construction, construction costs start to come down a little bit as folks start to try to firm up the 2023, uh, their pipelines on the, on the, the, subcontractor front? I would say they've, they seem like they're leveling off, right? I, we haven't seen the big dip. They haven't like decreased, like people aren't hungry for work yet, but I think it's just that we're in that like lag period where people are still finishing up that old pipeline built on old rates because there's still construction going on that was finance on the old rates. So now we're looking into the challenges of the new rates and new construction for the next window. And that's the one that's hard. So there's going to be a lag here if construction prices don't normalize to the new rates, because like you said, it just becomes non-buildable. Yeah. The other, the other thing in Boston that I'd love to see, there's literally no vertical high rise residential buildings in Boston. It's because they don't make, it's so expensive to build vertical and there's gotta be like, like we said, population's not going down, it's increasing and we're not increasing housing at even close to that rate. And being able to build the density in urban Boston would be a really big win for the city if we could figure out how to make that affordable, economical. Yeah. I think there needs to be a little bit of a change in psychology 
because the, most of the institutional investors, right, who are going to be the ones that are going to be providing the, the equity and debt for those projects, they're scared of downtown right now, right? And, and you know, if you look at downtown Boston and the financial district, they are scared. They would be scared to invest in a project like that because of what COVID, I think, has done to that market. Um, the hot trade right now is to invest in projects in the suburbs, right? To invest in multifamily mm -hmm. projects in the suburbs, which because they're in the suburbs and they're typically stick built, they're more affordable to build. So you can rent them for more affordable rents. They're somewhat transit oriented depending on where they are. And so that's kind of the, those are the projects that are getting financed right now. Um, the ones downtown that are high rise are very, very challenging to get done, both because construction costs are so high, rates are so high, but there's also this perception about our people returning downtown right? Um, yep. So. Is that going to happen? We'll see. I mean, like we said, there's no crystal ball, but that's as good of a prediction as we can get, right? Um, so our closing questions, I always look for a top book or a top podcast that you've read or listened to in the last year or so. Is there anything that comes to mind? Um, so I'm reading um, Fixer Upper by, by Jenny Schutz. Um, and it's, I think, the most comprehensive and I guess, articulate take on like why we have a housing crisis. And for anyone who just is interested in housing economics and zoning and, you know, what's going on on that front, I think that's just such a no brainer. Actually, I know uh, one of our partners, when he's doing new development, he just buys a bunch of copies of the books and hands it to the uh, the zoning board and the, uh, <laughs> the city councilors just so they can really understand that, you know, it's really wow. a supply and demand issue. And I think it's the book is just so well written and so easy to, to kind of get behind. Um, and that fixer upper fixer up. Yeah. That's yeah. 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 I mean, it's really a book about housing policy, but it's written in a really um, there, it's a, there's a low bar in terms of, of understanding. So anyone can pick it up and I think it's, it's really, Great really suggestion. well done. Great suggestion. Um, it's something I want to pick up because it's something I want to understand more, but it is classic supply and demand at, at yeah. its core, right? Yeah. Um, one piece of advice for emerging leaders. Ooh, I would say um, two things. One is when you're starting a company or you're trying to grow a business, um, you got to take the highs of the lows, right? And I think early on, for me, it was such a roller coaster. And I think understanding that nothing is ever as good or as bad as it seems, right? And just sleeping on sleeping on stuff, I think is is probably be the best thing for me to tell myself seven or eight years ago is just it's going to be okay. Um, and then I would also say, you know, find that mentor who's going to help you put the pieces in place to scale, right? Or or find the program or whatever it takes. But it's very easy to focus all in the business, and it's it's worth specking a little time to find the mentor or the program or um, the book that's going to help you think through spending time on the business and putting the infrastructure and process in place to do a really good job to continue to grow. There's a little, little nod to lifelong learning right there. You know, I can get behind that. All right, but here we right. go. It's the book. It's the program. It's the mentor. There's no one size fits all. So you got to just dive in and make it a habit because that's where you're going to find your answers. If you're not, if you're not out there asking those questions and seeking that counsel, you're never going to get it. Right. So learning oh, from your own experience is slow. That's what design oh, development is all about. All right. Well, um, Benji, thank you so much for joining today. I wish you, Danny Maul, your brother, everyone at Arcs Urban, all the best, uh, for people that want to learn more about you, or maybe even consider being a part of that conscious capitalism and starting to invest through your team. Uh, I know I think super highly of you and would recommend it. So, Yeah, just go to our website, arcsurban, A-R-X-U-R-B-A-N.com. Um, you can contact us through that and uh, go from there. Benji, looking forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you so much. Everyone, can't thank you enough for tuning in today. I hope you got a ton out of today's conversation. And if you could do us one favor, if you did get value, please like, share, and comment. Subscribe on whatever channel you're tuning in on. Please leave a review. It helps us expand and grow and support more people. That's the end goal. We want to bring the insights of these amazing guests to as many people as possible. Thank you. So I think everybody sees the glamorous photos. 
and the sellout numbers, the eye-popping sellouts at the end, but they don't really understand the journey and the risks and the sleepless nights. You know, we don't just talk about the balls that you smashed. There's there's a lot of at-bats, times that, that, that the play did not go the way you drew it up.